you caught me reading a book that's wonderful. Uh, Nikita Gills, great goddesses. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone that joined earlier uh, when I was talking to Shiloh. That was an amazing chat um, that I was very thankful for because I love Charlotte to bits and she offers a whole new perspective on various things. Um, but now, in our little surprise series, I get to talk to another friend of mine who's just fucking amazing. Um, her name is Nikita Gill. Um, is she going to join? Is her internet connection going to be good? Hi, Joey. Hello, Nikita. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I said it proper like, like all right, love. How are you doing, Nikita? <laughs> yeah, Nikita's joining me. Yeah, you came up in my last chat with Shiloh, which was uh, lovely. Because I think someone asked um, if she could recommend a book of poetry, and your name obviously came up. Oh! Yes! How are you, love? I'm okay. I'm a little bit out of it today, but otherwise I'm okay. Why? What's been happening? <laughs> Just painkillers. Um, so yeah, just, just, just not been very well. I've had like a tummy thing, so I'm, I'm better now. Oh no! So, yeah. <laughs> I have a painkiller here. I need, to get, <laughs> I, I need to get sponsorship from these motherfuckers. I swear to God, it's ridiculous. The amount of shit that I drink on this whole chat, they should totally pay me to drink this. It's ridiculous. <laughs> the fuck! And if you need some good painkillers, I have them from my knee surgery. So yeah. Zombie leg. <laughs> yes, zombie legs indeed. Because I have a part of a dead body in my knee. Yes. See, look, yes. this is this is what you were telling me about, and I was just like, that is just, that is just crazy. How does that feel? Um, I have another person inside of me. In a physical sense, not in a sexual sense, in a purely functional sense. <laughs> doesn't really do much it, it feels kind of like normal but yeah how are you though i mean like so you've had okay so the reason why we're doing this is not only we're good friends and stuff and i've missed you and i haven't seen you for fucking ages no. but you have a book out yes now i do i do and are you holding is... your phone by the way yes you fucking amateur get a phone holder no <laughs> i'm a huge amateur what the it's fuck true. <laughs> Big up Shiloh joining the chat. Oh, by the way, yeah, like I said, I think you and Shiloh need to meet, man. You're like just yes! two badass women that know a lot about art and mythology. And I love yeah. it. Love it, love it, love it. Like, that's exactly what we're going to do. So, yes. Uh, yes. And by the way, every chat I've had with you, I've held my phone like this. I think you've only just noticed. Really? Don't your hands get tired? And also, it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> It's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, so your new book is out. Yes, so it will be coming out uh, on the 1st of October, on the 29th of September uh, in the US and the 1st of October everywhere else. And Kiara says that you are her favourite poet. Aww, yeah, but what, so, so basically, this is, your, this is not the novel that you've been working on. Because um, Shiloh and I were discussing sort of Indian mythology and reinterpreting it, which is what you are doing, but writing a novel in verse. This is something else. Yeah, yeah. So I basically wrote a novel in verse um, that follows. <gasps> it's out. Fuck off. <laughs> Where's my copy, bastard? Original copies, like so. Yeah. Where's it's my just... copy? <laughs> what the fuck? What is this? You're showing me like, ha? Huh? Hey, you can't touch it. I only got it yesterday. These are all oh. the copies. Look what, came, look what came today. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, that is beautiful. And then check this, check this, check this, check this, check this, check this, check this. Check this. So the inner lining has all the lyrics. Oh my god! And then, and then watch this. <gasps> that is so beautiful. It's that is so beautiful. Ridiculous. I absolutely love it. It's ridiculous. And look at this. You'd think it's his fucking album, or he died, and this was his last ever thing. The fuck. Anyway, sorry. I just, I just, I just literally just chat all over your chips just then. So, so please continue. What you saying? No, that was amazing. I'm so excited. So you've got this book that I want, you bastard. Can I please yes. have it? I will. I will get you the the hardcover, the the glittery one. <laughs> the glow. <laughs> Wait, you see. It's and I'm waiting the, for uh... this in black still. Yeah, I know. I still don't have copies of that either from the Barnes and Noble, but. 
this will come and this will be like so i don't know if you can see but it's got like a little bit of an essence of the of the rainbow across the cover so oh, yeah. that's like yeah that's kind of an homage to the the flag the lgbt flag so the colors I can't that see you oh you mean like from the red to the the, the blue yeah the yeah 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 or the violet yeah. sorry the red to the violet yeah so it's it's kind of well because the main character is bisexual um so she's a bisexual south asian woman or girl and then growing up to being a woman so it's a coming of age story and it's got all the hindu de deities in it it's got like um you know it's illustrated which is great so where's all the big illustrations gone really see yeah this is why you need a phone holder for fuck's sake so that shikandi that shikandi from the bahabharat that's awesome yeah so it's a uh, he's a so he's basically a trans uh kind of like a demigod i would say because his connection to the gods themselves but right. yeah he's a trans demigod because he was um uh he was announced female at birth but actually he's always been a man so he's one of the most powerful warriors in the mahabharat and i found it really fascinating um that we've had so much because there's a lot of there's a lot of um queer heritage in um hindu myth and you know there's a lot of very strong women in hindu myth and it was just really great to kind of research all of that and bring it into a modern verse novel and kind of put it together and see what happens but yeah i'm really proud of this book it's got kashmir it's got partition it's got basically everything it's it. got like <laughs> it's got like a big target on your back from a bunch of cunts I'm sure it will. <laughs> that's always the case. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing. Okay, so I, I think that have, like being friends with such amazing women like you and like Shiloh, um, the way that I deal with um, aggressive assholes is very different. And she was talking about empathy and sort of offering love, and I just can't do that. How do you cope with that? Uh, so uh, <laughs> sorry I, for just yeah. being heavy. I'm sorry. I just took. Like just took a shit on your lap just. <laughs> no, your side was like. like <sighs> no, 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 no. So, so I do this thing where, um, so I, I, I've told everybody this, but when people ask me like, how do you deal with assholes on the internet? I'm like, I cry, I get angry, I internalize everything, I take everything very personally, and then after that, I just sit down, I switch everything off, and I let it go. but the biggest thing which i've learned not to do is respond reactively and immediately right that is like that is the worst thing you can do because what you end up doing is you respond with your base instincts and you end up responding in a way that isn't like you at all mm. you know um it It's basically kind of like the worst version of yourself exactly it's like lowering yourself to their level and then responding on the same level and it's just like well an asshole has a lot more experience at being an asshole than i do Yeah. So all that will end up happening is I'll get hurt. And mm. so it's just easier to kind of pull yourself out of that situation and realize and recognize it's not about you. It never is. If someone's mm. being horrible to you on the internet, like what do I do? I write poems which are about love and like, you know, loving people and and like But you you're know, also writing about yourself. queer brown women and comparing them to like and and tying ties with Hindu mythology which is going to be controversial, right? Of course it will be controversial, but at the end of the day, I haven't changed any of the gods. The gods respond in exactly the way they do. Um if people choose I uh, would like there's nothing disrespectful in the way that the gods in this story are. If someone takes offense to the queer rep in the book they're mm -hmm. taking offense on a personal level it's got nothing to do with hinduism or the religion itself because it's a very beautiful very respectful religion it's just the way that people are using it to justify their own wrong ideas mm. of of supremacy that is the problem i can, i And guess i i guess i ask cuz i want to learn how to react better yeah yeah that's probably what so and and anyway that's not the book that's coming out you've got another book coming out or you've got a book that's already out it's out it's out. this one i'm so excited i'm excited about all my books but this one is a really special book to me right so it's called slam you're going to want to hear this it's not called masala it's 
Damn. Me and my uncle jokes, man. Straight up uncle jokes in the house. Yo, masala. Everyone go get Nikita's masala. Yeah, man. This is, it is, but it, I'm so proud of this book, right? So it is a book of the most powerful voices pretty much in British verse right now. It is a book of black and brown poets who are just phenomenal at what they do. And each and every one of these poems, um, I, I was very, very like honored to be able to read and then select. Uh, we have like some amazing poets in there. Like, you know, we have Raymond Antrobus, we have Dean Atta, we have Sophia Tucker. We've got like such amazing poets in here. And so many of these poets, I actually got to witness like the, the first time they actually read out their poem on stage or they performed their po poem on stage because the book was literally conceived with Sim, Sim Sandhu who is uh, from Pan Mac. Um, and Who's she's a brilliant Mac? editor. Yeah, she's from Pan Macmillan, yes. And she's, she's like a brilliant, brilliant editor. Okay. And we kind of conceived this book um, almost at like the, for the Asia, for the Asia House Slam, which happens every year. So are, you, you, are you covering your mic now? Because you've got muffled. You've got muffled. Ah, there you go. Can you see now? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so like in 2018, I was one of the judges for the Asia House Slam. And it was an amazing event. We had like the most amazing performers. And I am honestly the worst judge because I just want to give everyone full marks all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're so lovely. Like, yes, you win a prize. You're like fucking Oprah. You win a prize. And you win a prize. And you have a prize. Yes, everybody has a prize. Really good. Everybody has a prize. Yeah. Um, it's just. It's incredibly hard to tell, like, especially when there's such amazing work being performed in front of you. Like, how do you tell someone that, hey, your amazing work isn't as good as that amazing work, but it's just like, but it's all amazing work. So I have like a newfound respect for judges now because it must be so hard to sit over there and go, here are all of these amazing artists and poets and writers. Now you must pick the best one out of all of them. Mm. Oh, <laughs> but how did you do that? So basically, uh, in a, in a DJ sense, basically you made a set, you curated a fucking like compilation album with this book. Yes, yes, and the best part about it was the book itself is amazing. But we did this audio book, which is a completely mad project. Because we went what, drinking we when you recorded it. I remember this. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, it was that crazy night, I remember. Okay, yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, because what we wanted was that we we wanted the, the, the audio book to be like an actual slam. So all of the poets performed their own work themselves. And I introduced each poet before they came on and mm. they spoke about why they wrote the poem and then they spoke the poem. And it was just designed and designed like a slam and we got everyone to come and do it. I think it was like 40 poets. That's so, awesome. yeah. I mean, one thing I've got to say, though, and I've got to be brutally honest with you, uh, because I love you. You're awesome. I hate spoken word. Why? I fucking hate spoken word. Uh, simply because there's an, an idea of, or maybe it's a, it's a preconceived notion of slam poetry, which is you can say anything and then say it in a certain way. And it doesn't have to rhyme. It has no context. You can sort of read out a shopping list in a certain way. It's like, ugh. But having said that, having seen your work and having seen your like epic hour long monologue, and then obviously <laughs> you read out poets, uh, sorry, hearing you read out your poems, I understand a certain, I have a certain appreciation for it, but generally spoken word just drives me nuts. I think that's really interesting because I found that I've always thought that uh, a lot of spoken word performers very easily translate themselves to being musicians as well. Mm. Because they understand the cadence of, of how sound should flow. That they make even regular words without any kind of music sound so beautiful and musical. Mm. And that's why I have such a great love for like the, the performance poetry scene. Because I think there's so much that someone can... It's such an amazing skill to stand in front of... I don't know what just happened there. Sorry. <laughs> this is glitched out. It's fun. But yeah, it, it is a skill for sure. I think maybe it's a personal um, issue I have because there's no instrumentation. Um, but then I found a whole new level of respect for your work uh, because Aww. it just, you know, that, that, that single woman show that you did was mind-blowing. 
Oh, thank you. That means yeah. a lot to me. Yeah, but I mean, explain that for people watching that don't know, please. Oh, um, so are you talking about so I, like the 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 one hour long thing which I did? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, so what I basically did was I decided because I'm insane um, that I was going to do 10 nights in uh, Clapham at a wonderful theater called the Omnibus. And I'm really looking forward to when they open up again because they're really lovely and supportive. And it was basically just me on stage as the goddess Hera. And it was a monologue, a story told by the goddess Hera, which was the real story of Olympus and what really happens. And the reason I chose Hera is because I think that she's a very vilified character in, in, like, in Greek mythology. She's considered the most villainous character in Greek mythology because the story basically is that her husband, Zeus, who is the king of the gods, is a very, very unfaithful man. Mm. Literally... Anything with a pulse, anything with a pulse, right? I so mean, Hera... animal, vegetable, mineral, male or female. And a backbone and a heartbeat is kind of optional. Zeus is trisexual, very much trisexual. Try anything, anything, you'll try it once. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he, so he, was, he was that kind of guy. And the thing is, she was the goddess of marriage, right? So there was no way she could leave him. Because she was the goddess of marriage. She, the goddess of marriage leaving her own husband. That's just an insane thing. But she was... The whole point of the play was to examine why she suffered from such bad internalized misogyny that she kept punishing the women in his life instead of punishing him. And so the play kind of takes this course of when That she, sounds like India right now. Internalized misogyny. Sorry for it. Sorry for interrupting you. No, no. Internalized misogyny is a really big problem, and I think there is so much harm. I I write about this quite frequently. Harm that women do onto other women, without even considering for a second that they are societally, you know, they, they're they're brainwashed into thinking that other women are the enemy. Which is why so much of my work revolves around women loving women, women the sisterhood, supporting each other trying to see how we can big each other up and build each other up instead of breaking each other down. Mm. You know, I think it's so important because even in this book, a lot about like in girl and goddess, a lot of, a lot of it revolves around sisterhood and there is a lot of like bullying and girl on girl bullying, etc. in this book because it follows her teenage years, but mm. it is so important like for her to find sisters in this book and to cultivate friendships with women and you see how healing and nurturing they are. So yeah, that's, that's so I think that, like I think that those themes were carried over so well in your whole play, whatever you want to call it, your whole hour long monologue. And that's what convinced me that spoken word wasn't shit. And so therefore I have faith about your book Slam. And if it's an audio book as well, and you've got all these like 40 poets, I mean, mm -hmm. how long is it? It's only two and a half, two hours, two hours, 40 minutes long. Okay. Uh, because each of the pieces is not more than three, four minutes long each. Yeah. I don't and have to shit all over your book, by the way. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to sort of ruin that. No, no. It's a beautiful book. And like, it's, there's so much black and brown excellence in this book. And that's what it was all about. Like you should have, if you were in the room, like with all of us, it was just so lovely for all of us just to be there and have that real sense of community whilst we were creating this audio book. Um, it's really sad because what I really wanted was like to do a big launch and like all of the poets to be there together and just to have this really beautiful kind of, you know, connection. But then um, COVID Corona. happened and obviously, yeah. <laughs> Dude, but you need to come back for like a night out on the tiles. We haven't done that for so long. Yes! Absolutely. Speaking of that, yes. But listen, how long is your poem in that book? And can you read it? I have two poems in the book. And I think you heard both of them, actually. Um, one of them was at the last event that we did together. So it was that one, that one. Uh, oh, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. That read, one. <laughs> read it, read it, read it. Go on. Yeah, Nikki is reading okay. us a poem. It's like a bedtime story. Yes. It's like a bedtime story. I in love fact, that. you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go we while you do it because I've heard it before. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh. 
Hello. <laughs> I am going to read you guys a poem. It's actually a poem that I don't think anyone has heard, but it is in this book. So it's called The Guy My Parents Want Me to Marry Asks Me to Describe Myself. So this is back when um, my parents were still like kind of taking me around this arranged marriage um, thing. And what what was happening was I was meeting a lot of like boys that my parents liked for me. And we'd sit and we'd have a conversation and then we kind of decide if we liked each other, right? Because that's just how it is. Um, but yeah, so this is how the poem goes. Look, I'm a commitment phobe. And this isn't my fault. This is because people are generally crap. Too many lovers who have insisted they loved me have left the hot water running too long in my house and not cared about the planet in the very specific way I do, or voted Tory, or told me my alu gobi isn't great. And I'll have you know it's bloody brilliant. Or not cared for red wine and... Sorry. What I'm trying to say is, don't worry. I'm not due to fall in love till 2024 anyway. My tarot cards told me so. I mean if you believe in that kind of thing. I mean, it's not wild that I check my horoscope every morning, is it? Or that I know I'm a Gemini moon, a Gemini sun, Aries moon, Capricorn rising. And if the day is going to be bad for any of those three signs, I carry red jasper in my red pocket for anxiety and an amethyst in my bra to dispel bad luck. None of this is weird. I know, because my tarot cards told me so. But really, the best way to get to know me is not to read the poetry. Don't follow me on Instagram. And for goodness sakes, definitely don't visit my Twitter. You see, women like me, we are made from a different kind of mud. We watched our mothers wear silence instead of mouths for so long, follow religions that told them that women are always smaller than men in their lives. We didn't have a choice but to let these repressed voices grow into howls in our bellies. Let them swell and tumble out like jagged opinions. We built skyscrapers instead of castles, read Audre Lorde instead of William Wordsworth, bell hooks instead of Mahatma Gandhi, sharpened our bones into knife points just in case we needed to weaponize our bodies. And, and it doesn't stop there. You see... Those are the better parts. You see, hiding pain as courage is what all good wolves do. I have named harsh hands home. I have stumbled after women who could not decide if I was an experiment or a forever. I have been a scarlet woman for so long, I cannot even remember his name. Just the red letter he left on my mind. You need a cast iron stomach to digest me, which is to say, I don't think there is anyone in this world who can survive me, which is to say, sometimes you need to leave wild things just the way you found them, alone. Fucking gangster. <laughs> Woo! Smashed it. Fucking hell, that's a great fucking piece of work. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. It's one of my favorites I wrote this year. So, <laughs> mate, that must have come from somewhere fucking dark. What was the process? Do you mind me asking? No, absolutely. Um, I wrote it on a train coming back from a really disappointing. I, I say disappointing, but what it was was expected almost. Um, I think like women go through these really jarring moments due to the patriarchy and due to like personal trauma and we kind of go through these things which we just end up like putting down and not talking about and repressing right and then we kind of speak to our mothers and we realize that they've gone through those things as well so it was one of those phone calls that I'd had with my mother just after going through an instance like that and she kind of went yeah that used to happen to me all the time and I was like oh my god you know like we bond over those things as well. 
and it's it's trauma bonding is is probably something which we should talk about more often between mothers and daughters because trauma bonding is both very powerful and very ja- and very jagged and jarring so that's mm. where that poem kind of came from and it's um, very difficult because... to talk about when there's a shame culture as well was it easy for you to talk to your mom or was it was it really difficult did you have to prize it out of her i mean i think it's with my mom it it's always been one of those things where if something happens to me and i tell her about it then she's able to talk about it mm. so it's almost like she needs me to say it first mm. and then she'll say it and it's it's really interesting i think it's really fascinating like how sometimes which is why i constantly talk about this when something painful happens to you if you talk about it other people will talk about it mm. and it's like case in point with my mom she won't she won't talk about it until i talk about it so i have to use my voice mm. you know yeah i just realized this was public i was going to say something but i'm not going to uh but yeah i was like yes and ha huh. and then i asked your advice about how lord is shit i was like okay yeah we're public um <laughs> But yeah, fuck, that was was that difficult for you to write? You or was it cathartic? Piece, well, after you finish writing it it always feels really cathartic, but when you're writing it it's because you're processing a lot of emotions at once, it's really hard because you're also reliving things. One of the things with poetry is if you want other people to feel, you have to feel it really hard as well, which mm. means every single thing that you're writing has to be almost like a open wound. Mhm. So you're opening up a wound so that you can let it heal. And that's the right. way that I look at my poetry, especially my harsher, my darker poems. It's like opening up a brand new wound and then you're letting it heal. Yeah. And this there's, there's a kind of patriarchal kind of golden thread that runs through a lot of this shit that that's then reinforced that's very difficult to even get to. let alone open the wound it's like def- like difficult to even know it's there like it's, it's like a yeah. splinter but you've ignored the splinter you know what i mean yeah uh, exactly. and it's just like yo the flesh is grown over so hard that you have to kind of get into it with a fucking knife or something um but yeah what's your other poem in the book then oh um so yeah so this this poem is a poem called everything i never asked him so it's a much shorter poem and it's did you do this one at the gig as well Sorry? Did you uh perform this one at the gig we did as well in March? No, I, did I? I don't think I did actually. Not this one. one. About sort of arranged marriages and expectations and That was the one. That the one that I just read out. Okay, that was right, that right. one. I was uh, I was I, peeing so sorry I missed that. <laughs> no, no. No, um I think this this the other one which I which I have in this book is Everything I Never Asked Him which is a poem about kind of like the expectations which are on boys and men and like the questions that we don't ask the men in our lives that we should ask you know and kind of give them an like did you brush your teeth did you wipe properly those kind of questions <laughs> no that's not it the questions about emotion oh fuck okay <laughs> we're going down this soft touchy feely path the fine feelings the But feelings before no. you read this poem like is this book out everywhere now yes it is it is i'm so excited that this book is does out everywhere does it say slam book. by nikita gill or what, what what does it say it says slam it says masala so chosen by nikita gill okay cool slam you're going to want to hear this which i love um so yeah this one's called everything i never asked him Mm-hmm. and it basically like i said it's all about the concept of like masculinity and how we don't allow we don't ask the right questions of our boys and men and don't, therefore don't give them the opening to be able to talk about these things so how often do you tell your mother that you love her how often has your father held you and let you cry did you ever love a soul who always knew who you always knew would never love you back did you ever love a man fiercely enough to hold him close yet not name him brother can you speak of the first girl who broke your heart without calling her something cruel to can your heart ever heal from the things you will never tell me were done to you is there a worship inside you 
that calls for the forgotten forgiveness in you? Is there a sacred you wish someone knew and understood too? A sweeter language you wish someone else knew too? Have your fingers known fists before they knew the openness of holding hands? Has your skin known bruises before it has known the touch and tenderness of touch? What would you be the god of? What would you be the god of? If they made you a god of soft things, would you finally learn gentle in ways it was withheld from you? That's the other one. Shit. My answer to that is like destruction. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is like, what would you be the god of destruction? Totally. <laughs> You'd be Shiva. That's it. I mean, dude, that's, the, that's an archetype I can get along with. Like, I'd definitely go and hang out with that guy. <laughs> he's amazing isn't he i mean look in terms of like encapsulating female male energy we discussed this with shiloh earlier as well uh in, in terms of like dance drugs drums rock and roll anti-establishment being kind of trans essentially you know accepting yeah. all energies like mm. yeah he's amazing and i love it because one of the things i think i discussed this with you before is that Shiva is absolutely not anything to do with the binary, right? He is like the god of balance. Um, you can be like, so the idea that Ravan is like a massive Shiv Bhakt and is, is amazing because it's just pure power, right? It's not about the, the hierarchy of good and evil. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think there's something incredibly powerful about um, the fact that Shiva is one of the few gods that didn't see any differences between the Asuras and the Devas, even though the Asuras and Devas were always fighting and the Devas were always cast as the good, the forces of the good. And the Asuras were always cast as like the forces of, you know, impulse and childlikeness and, and you know, immaturity. So they were always looked at like that. And, in some force, and some people demonized them and said that they were demons. Sorry, someone just said a great, uh, I can't say his name, and the weenie palace dudette, uh, says that Shivaji has anger, anger issues, and I would agree with that. He does. I would agree he with does. that. That's... <laughs> he does. He did do the thing where he went and cut off his own son's head. So, you know, like, we, he did have anger issues. <laughs> and sort of burn the god of young, like, love. Karma just got burnt. Because they were trying to fuck with his meditation. Like, yo, he has got anger issues. You're totally right. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's probably why I can sort of, uh, I find such a kinship with him. But yeah, you were saying, sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no. I just think it's really interesting. In, um, Ganesh appears in this book because I have a lot, I have a major affinity for Ganesh and he is the god of writers. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> and that's, Kali and a clubber, not Shiva, but yeah. It's the first Shiva sound system projection that we had at a warehouse rave. But anyway, please continue. Sorry. No, but he, yeah, like Kali appears in this book as well. All the favorites, all the favorites are in this book. All the hits. And there's Riz. The <laughs> Speak your favorites. <laughs> so, <laughs> someone's just asked, what book is that? You have to tell them. Yeah. The Girl and the Goddess. So that's my new book. And it's coming out on the 1st of October. Um, I really wanted it to come out on the 31st of October because, you know, Halloween. But yeah. <laughs> that would have been perfect for like a, a witchy kind of vibe. Which is exactly what this book is. This book has a lot about the tarot in it as well. So it's like it's very spiritual and it's got like a bit of a witchy vibe. It's got a grandmother who could or couldn't be magic, you know. <laughs> I mean, all grandmothers are magic. Let's just be like straight up with that. No matter how conservative a grandmother is, there's always magic. Absolutely. She, but she, equally, she, like you've gone from having like this whole COVID lockdown thing to then having two books out. Yeah, I'm working on a third one right now. Oh, because there's not enough to do. <laughs> no, I'm 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 really I'm really excited because I think this current book which I'm working on. It's a book about hope. So it's all, it's literally called uh, Where Hope Comes From. And it's like, it's a book of poems about like love and hope and, and peace and, you know, just how to find your inner peace. 
because one of the greatest criticisms which has ever been leveled against my poetry from um, damn sorry from academia is that I uh, think you're going to say assholes and it glitched out on the a as you said that like from assholes uh but no academia sorry you were saying S- same difference sometimes um but <laughs> but anyway so like they basically say things like oh it's self help poetry and i look at that and i'm just like for a long time it was supposed to be like a bad thing and then i just looked at it and i said what's what's bad about writing poetry which people look at and go hey this helped me like that just seems like a really weird thing to accuse somebody of like be that's a bad thing but then this also comes down to the criticism that art has been so dissected that a lot of people seem to forget that one of the big reasons behind why people create art is just to have fun Mm. I write poems because I love writing poems. I'm not writing poems for like people to dissect and go, okay, but like, what is the academic relevance of this? No, I just wanted to write a poem about a tree today. <laughs> <laughs> There's. Have you seen? Okay, so when Anushka, uh, Anushka's dad was inducted to the no, you got a Grammy, right? So Ravi Shankar got a Grammy, um, and her and Nora Jones did a speech. and anushka opened it in a fucking brilliant way which is like um you know there's a debate about whether people make music to connect with people or to get laid and it must be a similar sort of thing in terms of writing it's got to be a, like a similar kind of assertion in writing like i'm going to put this out there and there's a kind of stance that it gives you yeah 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 and i think what's it's really funny because literally I sp- it's it's something it really hit me hard when someone actually sat me down and said so why do you write and I said well I write to have because I like writing I love poems I love writing stories that's why I write and they're like do you ever sit down and think I am going to write this book which is going to be super pretentious and like impress academia <laughs> like do you ever do that do you or write, write a book to get late which is the other point <laughs> which is which was actually the thrust of my question which is have you ever done that have you ever written a book that's like yeah <laughs> that's going to make me hot and the thing is like honestly it's not i love your side stepping in the answer there just like completely just like honestly ignore that and <laughs> <laughs> i don't write books to get laid norm <laughs> okay that's the difference between writers and musicians then fine so sorry, sorry please oh, continue oh right is that totally a thing i thought that was a stereotype yeah, no, i didn't know that thing. Thing. Oh, you know, I'm going to pull this. I'm going to pull this interview up while you're talking. So please continue. I'll pull this. I'll pull this up and show you. It's one of the best speeches ever. But please continue. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are writers who write like poems to like, or or stories to get laid. But like, how would that work? We're not exactly a very exciting bunch. We're a very dull bunch of people. Oh, mate. I I, I like. Okay, wait. So Shiloh, Shiloh, the artist who I was yes. speaking to earlier, she's like, I yes. paint to get laid. Let's be honest. <laughs> I mean I mean if I write to get laid it has clearly not the kind of writing that gets me laid because it's not worked right like... <laughs> I mean I mean there you go there you go so let's hope let's hope. <laughs> Okay, I found it. 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 Right. So I'm going to stop this music and play this video because it's awesome. Hang on. I'm just going to There you go. Where it? I I I flip this up. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But there you go. There you go. There you go. So we would like to thank the Recording Academy on behalf of our dad. Um we know he was very excited to be receiving this award and um we really miss him. and you know he just lived and breathed music he was always tapping out rhythms at the breakfast table and you know making me do 5 over 7 <laughs> i'm still trying to get it but um <laughs> anyway thank you so much and um we we are very happy to accept your award for him um it was uh, 60 days ago today i just counted um that he passed away so it's kind of difficult to be standing up here um Like Nora said, I'm thrilled that he knew about this award before he passed at least. Um, but I wish we weren't standing up here for him. Um I want to quickly say a thanks to my mom um because if he was here he would be doing that. 
um, because he uh, was alive till 91 and he did his last performance just a few weeks before he died. And I really think that she's the reason that he was able to be as healthy and as strong as he was. So I'm eternally grateful to you for that. Um, I had a, a quick thought earlier when, when um, it was being discussed whether music is, is for fun or whether it's to help us get laid. Um, and um, my, my father always said that music could create world peace because it had the potential to raise the consciousness of people who tuned into their souls and their beings through listening to music, through playing music. And if anyone saw my father play, he, he could certainly have fun. And um, as too many women felt like they needed to tell me um, he could certainly get laid. Um, <laughs> did I just say that? Um, I said it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but when I watched him play, what moved me the most was that he, he could take people to this, this incredible meditative state, you know, where they would just close their eyes and cry and just get in touch with something more important. And then that's something that's inspired me most about him. Um, I'll finish quickly on one story about the kind of musician he was, which is um, when I was a child, my mom realized we couldn't find his Grammy anywhere. And he'd <laughs> lost it. Um, and I guess he left it in a suitcase at a friend's house years ago and didn't know what had happened to it. So we made loads of fun of him for losing a Grammy. And um, when she called up the Academy to see if they could get a copy made, um, they said, certainly we can make a copy. Which Grammy is it that you want to get copied? And she said, what do you mean, which Grammy? And it turns out he'd won two, and he just didn't know it. <laughs> um, that was the kind of musician he was. He didn't know he had two Grammys. He went on to win a third, and, and today he gets this incredible honor. But at the end of the day, it was the music itself that really mattered to him, and, and it was the be-all and end-all of his life. And I'm really grateful to the Academy for recognizing that. So thank you. So yeah, do you oh write poems God. to get laid or not? Anushka, man. She's Anushka. a fucking gangster. Oh my God. I am never going to get over the proms. I'm never going to get over that. Never. That never. was something else. That was just, it was another level. It really was like the goddess of music is like walking amongst us. Just amazing. She's a fucking gangster. Just amazing. Totally I will gangster. never get over that. So yes, you don't write poems to get laid, but you publish books. <laughs> I write books for children. Um, I write for, I write YA books. When I write an adult book, I will tell you if it helps. Get All of your books are adult books. Are you kidding me? They're not really. <laughs> yeah, they deal with like so many subjects of like strength and assertion of gender and all of these things totally truth truth actually um this is actually probably my first why really why it's like it's a why novel in verse and and the character goes from the age of well since before she's born till 18 so yeah and i'm really proud so, i'm really yeah from so, the womb to adulthood essentially so it really is why it really is young adult yeah it really is a YA book and it's literally split into three sections. So it's childhood, teenage years, and womanhood. So I'm really, and honestly, it's uh, the three the three sections of the book are in three different places. So the childhood is in Kashmir, and then she goes to Delhi, and then finally she comes to London. So yeah. Oh fuck! It's your life. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It's totally your life. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone could read this book and be like, "Ha, huh, I know Nikita." <laughs> it's uh, uh, Ravi Shankar. I mean, Ravi Shankar. his book's awesome. <laughs> no, someone was asking, "Can you?" Um, oh, tell the me artist. Is dying. The artist oh, right. I, I, was away, like, yeah. I thought you were just jumping. Yeah, Ravi Shankar, um, <laughs> who's a fucking icon. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, that was years ago. <laughs> That was a long, long time ago. But it still makes me think about the reasons why we do things. And there's an impulse to actually just create and move culture along against any kind of um, pushback. Mm -hmm. And for you, in particular, being a woman from India in the UK writing and having a fucking book deal with a publisher that can get your work out there, it's pretty badass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I, I, I still feel like I, I got really, really lucky. 
um i did i worked very hard like it's been what i've been writing since i was 12 and i think it's very easy when you reach like when you find when you've had a few books published to almost especially for women we we tend to gaslight ourselves a lot and we start thinking but do i deserve to be here do i deserve this do, and you kind of like neglect all of the hard work you put in to be here because you also get told by other people constantly that you know let alone your visa application sorry let alone your visa application well yeah <laughs> yeah but sorry i was making a joke please continue yes no 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 i was just saying that um it's another thing about like i've been talking to a lot of women artists recently about imposter syndrome and it is um it is an epidemic like to not to you know but it is it is it's it's it is one of the i literally every woman i know has gone through like who is a woman creative woman artist um and i'm sure it's in loads of other fields as well goes through major imposter syndrome like major imposter syndrome constantly second guessing yourself constantly doubting your success constantly feeling like oh do i deserve to be here am i allowed to be here am i allowed to take up this space and you could be like i forget who i was like reading about but this really major like very well known singer and she was talking about it, like critically acclaimed singer was going oh yeah i i go through imposter syndrome all the time and i'm like you are a critically acclaimed extremely popular highly awarded singer and it's just like yeah it's just something we all deal with and i think maybe it's something that artists in general deal with but i've spoke, every woman i know deals with it everyone mm. which is it's terrifying <laughs> i you know i think that i i can't equate to that because i'm a dude and i'm very blessed with the 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 xy chromosomes so i have a lot less struggle but i kind of get that with being brown i guess so i can understand and also nikesh shukla who's a gangster is on this chat and i just want to say to him dokla what is he on the chat he just waved yeah yeah nikesh also big up bailey hi bailey um and also a lot of people agree about imposter syndrome yeah how did you how did you tackle that how did you get over that do you know i think it's a it's it's a daily process for me uh because some really daily matters. even even with your success even with all of that it's a daily process it, it, you don't it, feel as though you're just like a oh, fucking i can say what i want to and i've no. heard that right you know the the funny thing is i do i do say what i want to um i've just realized quite i think a few years ago i just realized that you know what if sorry I was, i'm laughing at nick as he's saying no my i hate you sorry i i was listening but i i laughed no, I hate you. i'm sorry i'm sorry please continue no. No, I was just saying like imposter syndrome is something that I just think I, it is a daily thing and I think so, as someone who goes through anxiety and like depression and all of all of those things on like a constant roller coaster I know that it's not a straight line like you will have good days and you'll have bad days and the best thing you can do really is just be kind to yourself on the days when you're going actually you're shit because that's what your brain does to you you just turn around and start berating yourself <laughs> So how um, useful has social media been to you in terms of a positive because you've obviously you obviously have a massive presence which I didn't know about until we became friends but there must be a, there's a lot of love on the comments for you for example does that help Yes of course like honestly I am very very um fortunate that my audience is very warm very receive very receptive and like most of the events that i've done i've just had the loveliest audiences who've just always been so responsive and so you know open to receiving as opposed to turning around and going uh actually i have less of a question and more than a more of a statement which does happen like it has happened once where i was in <laughs> was so that sounds like all of my chats where i just talk at people and then like like discuss No I was I was at an event and like at the end they did the Q&A and this man stood up and like later on I found out something else but he stood up and he was like not all men are like this that and the other and I was just like hang on hang on hang on because the book that I was reading from was great goddesses and the only people who come across badly in that are Zeus and Poseidon and I'm like well the only two 
male gods who come across badly in this book are Zeus and Poseidon. So if you're associating all men with them, I think your brain needs a little bit of fixing. And then later on, it came out that he's having quite a nasty divorce and he just kind of decided that I was the person to take that out of. So <laughs> like, that happens. <laughs> I mean, I know you're very, very lovely, but I actually kind of feel that you have an aggressive undercurrent where you could slap the shit out of someone if you needed to. I have to very much control the mazikeen in me. <laughs> so Cause you're also a fucking giant. Like next to me, it's like a fucking like you're twice my height. So like any dude that can talk shit to you has got to have some fucking stones on them. Cause I'm like, hi Nikita, <laughs> hi. It's your round now. Can you buy the shots, please? Like what the fuck? <laughs> No, it does make me laugh. It makes me giggle all the time because, um, yeah, I, I am very tall. And people still mess with me, man. They still come up to me and try and mess with me. And it's just like, I I am very tall. I I will I will sit on you. And also, but the, here's the thing, right? And, and, and here's, here's where I, I have my sort of male um, issues in terms of, my use of language because I would describe your projection of um, your, your feminist projection as being accessible, which shouldn't fucking matter. You know what I mean? It shouldn't actually matter how accessible your viewpoints are. Um, do you wrestle with that? Do you wrestle with sort of taking like, this is my, my, what I want to do and how to make it accessible or is it just fucking natural to you? It's very like I speak, I think my presences online are very much who I am in real life. Like I remember doing an interview once and someone asked me, they're like, so is this you in real life? And I'm like, yes, this, what does that mean? And I'm guessing it's because some people have an outdoor personality and like, oh, what, sorry? like they have like an outdoor personality. So like right. when they go on, on and, and do interviews and things like that, they become a certain way. And then there's like, when they're not on camera, when they're not doing those interviews, they just become a different person. So um, it was really funny because the person who was with me, who was doing the interview, she was sitting with me outside as well. She was just like, no, this is just what Nikita's like. She just, she just says things. <laughs> yeah. It's just who she is, which is really but, nice, right? Like, ooh. yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I talked over you. Please continue. No, 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 no. Carry on. You were saying... Um, but yeah, it just, that's basically all I wanted to say. It's just, this is who I am. This is what I'm like. And I don't, I don't sit there thinking, oh, is my language going to be accessible? Because I think the people that it needs to reach, the words will reach, basically. So when it comes to putting a book out there, right, and, and actually then supporting that book, uh, like, for example, your novel, which is a novel yeah. in verse, which is yeah. Shakespearean, you bastard. <laughs> Um, like, talk about sort of like towing the line with the fucking English aristocracy and fucking the the norms, right? A novel in verse, because I'm Nikki to Gill. Um, mm. But you must consider, I, or in fact, not you must, I'm not dictating to you, but you must have thought about how this would be received publicly. Oh, yeah, all the time. First of all, and, I And, that, and that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at in terms of the artistry you must have considered how each line will be received, no? Not, I mean, because this book is quite personal. Firstly, I just want to say, Anushka, I love you and you're bloody fabulous as well. <laughs> first, I just want you to do that first. And then, um, but you know, the funny thing with this book is because it's really personal um, and it's about my grandmother, like, you know, got bits of like my family in it. It, it's it's a really personal sort of book and that's why I haven't sat here you know, kind of like thinking over and over again about how it's going to be received because I just wrote the poems all to my younger self and that's how yeah that's basically what this book is it's just full of poems of memories that I remember from when I was a child um, yeah but yeah, because it's a story, I think I thought a lot about the story I was going to write because people are going to read the story. So I was thinking more about the story, the overarching narrative and the characters as opposed to anything else. The whole gang! 
Everyone's here. Sorry, I just kept getting distracted because all my faves are in the comments. Big up, Nikesh. <laughs> Nikesh thinks I'm okay, the bastard. Oh, Nikesh, let me show you this, dude. Well, we're here. There's this quick plug. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's so it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. That's it's it. So... It's so beautiful. But then also, Nikesh, watch this. Watch this. It's Every time so lovely. <laughs> Dude, it feels it feels like it just like like if I had a huge penis, this is what it would feel like to get it out. Like ta-da! This anyway. is public, just so you're yeah, aware. It's <laughs> I know, but I agree. Yo, yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Uh, but you know, I imagine what it would be like. That didn't help. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Yes, and also this video will say without the comments, so it will just look ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. I was Pick up Ninja in the comments. Yes. There, there, are your mom jokes happening in the comments, and this is making me laugh so much. What, yes. what are the mom jokes in the comments? There's mom jokes in the comments between Anushka uh, and Nikesh. You know, what? I'm going to screenshot this, right? I'm going to screenshot this because this is evidence, right? Right. Anushka Shankar says, "I'll do your mom." It's perfect. <laughs> that, that just actually fucking like exemplifies everything that happens offline that's wonderful <laughs> but yes and this could just said penis okay great <laughs> i'm dying the comments are just hilarious i love it so much <laughs> this is one of uh, you know what? We were we were actually yeah. The bourbon is talking, can't they? Thank you. Yes, the bourbon is definitely talking. Um, but you were making a point before it all got sidetracked by yeah, Nikesh. I was that. I've completely forgotten what my point was. No, all I was saying was that this book is. Um, all the poems are very much memories and things which I remember happening. So what? So you guys are being serious. <laughs> No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It, Anushka, it... you're allowed to just derail the conversation whenever you want to. <laughs> By the way, do you think, actually, Anushka, if you were on the comments, were you watching when I played your Grammy speech? Because that was amazing, by the way. Yeah. That was the best speech ever. Just, a, I mean, everything Anushka does is brilliant. You know, like, I have, like, major girl crush. So, yeah. <laughs> You're thinking, you're be you're going to say something mean, aren't you? Now? I'm going to stop myself. So please continue. And this is properly shocked. Like, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was all about, basically, we discussed whether, um, if uh, Nikita writes poetry to get laid, and then... In fact, you know what? This whole conversation has been derailed by Anushka several times. <laughs> like, with her Grammy speech, and then now, again, she's just like, yo, what the fuck? Like, just coming in, derailing shit. But yes, please continue with what you were saying. I, love... uh, I can't remember. <laughs> no, but I think I was just talking about, like, how this book is really personal to me and how, like, there's so much stuff mm. in here. Um, including like first loves and the first like girl I loved and all of that. So it's 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 a really personal book in that way. So yeah, I think what the, the <laughs> what I tried to capture in this book was like the brutality of first love and how everything feels so intense all the time and how cruel first love can be, especially oh, yeah. when you're both kind of discovering your sexualities and your sexuality isn't heteronormative and how you end up being cruel to each other because the world isn't going to understand. So it's got, it's a very layered book and it kind of covers, you know, um, biphobia, etc. cetera, within mm. uh, South Asian culture, which is, you know, homophobic. There can be a lot of homophobia and biphobia there. So it's it was a really difficult book to write in some ways because it's so personal. But at the same time, it was a very empowering book to write because it was just like, this is my story. This is yeah. my truth. And there's only one way to tell this story and that is to tell the truth. 
And you do that really fucking well. But listen, love, we've got like some time. We've got like, it's going to cut us off in 20. Hello. This has been quite an evening, like fucking four hours. Ridiculous. So as a surprise, my friend Nikita has joined us uh, before we spoke for about an hour and I had to go we, but also Instagram kicked us off, which was very helpful. Hopefully she'll rejoin us. And so it won't just be me talking shit to you. Hi. Um, Ropataka, Shaz90, Magara. That's a great name. Hi, Magara. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll wait for Nikita to get back online and join me. Um, so it won't just be us three. Yeah. This is kind of a weird little party right now. But it'll get better. Trust me. Hi, Karthik. Hi, Shiloh. Shiloh, I spoke to her earlier. Uh, our conversation is will be online um, at nerm.co.uk slash insta. In fact, all of these whole sort of lockdown interviews are online there. So feel free to watch them whenever you'd like. Shadow drank a bottle of wine. Good. I've drunk like a lot of this. Very bad. Hey, Nikita's here. Adding her friendship. Oh, shit. I... Wait. Oh, 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 oh. Hang on. Sorry. I accidentally called someone completely random. Sorry. Hi, citizen of Austinville, 666. Hey! <laughs> Dude, you like me. <laughs> now, I've put my phone on like a, a little holder this time. So like, it'll stay. It's where your hands get <laughs> you, you. But it's like, it's oh, like God, what happens when I poop in the morning, I'm like. <laughs> and then finally, I feel free. <laughs> but yes, sorry, you were saying something before we got cut off. No, no, I just, I'd finished. I was just talking about like, yeah, this being a really personal book and everything. And I illustrated it myself. Which book? Which was lots of fun. Yes. Not the book that's out now. Come on, be Gujarati about this shit. Plug the book you have out now. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Come on, sell the book you have out right now. And then talk about the one coming out later. Come on, please. Okay, okay, okay. Stop making okay. me mansplain this shit to you. Cheap. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> Why you be like this? Sell your book, bastard. This is the book which is out now. This is a very important book to me. And it's because this is all about like the amazing, amazing poets who have influenced me, whose work is like absolutely amazing. The youngest poet in this book is only 17. And this was like the first time her works got published in a book. And she's super excited about it. So that was absolutely amazing. And her poem is about tinnitus, which is a condition where you keep hearing. I call it tinnitus. It's just... Tinnitus. But tinnitus. Well, I could, I could be wrong. I could I be wrong like, also. I was just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, could be easy, I could easily be wrong. But yeah, it's, it's... I mean, there's so many beautiful poems in here. So the book is divided into six sections. So oh, home, just, just to clarify, then... do you want to explain what tinnitus is or tinnitus is? So I think it's basically a condition in which you hear like major ringing in your ears, which can lead to getting headaches. It can lead to like lots of other like. So I know a friend, a friend of mine gets quite imbalanced because of this constant ringing that she has in her ears, because that's kind of where you get your balance from as well. So it's yeah it's a really complicated condition to have but it's also a really annoying condition to have um because all you hear is this constant ringing in your ears so you can't really enjoy or you know live your life to the fullest so i think it's yeah it's probably a really like one of my ex's dads had it and it used to make him really really bad tempered all the time so you know it it's really interesting the kind of like invisible um conditions that people can have on our living with and how we can sometimes dismiss those people as like oh that person's probably just rude and it's like well no they're probably living with a condition which is making them really really uncomfortable <laughs> i'm going to use that as an excuse from now on no for my rudeness and my general assholery is that i have a condition Don't! i'm generally just I an asshole because i have a condition a mistake 
I made a it huge explains, mistake. Oh my ass out. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Cheers. No. <laughs> But this book basically has uh six sections and it is home, kin, geology, protest, desire and acceptance. Those are the six sections. And one of my favorite poems in this book is My Dua is Love. So this is your current Sa- book slam that's out right now. Guju. Card book slam. It is out right now. beautiful celebration of black and brown voices um a good thing so <laughs> sorry i cut you off again please good. continue sorry yes. <laughs> no a good thing a good thing basically and i'm really really proud of this book because um a lot of people tend to ask me hey so who are the poets that you're reading and the poets that inspire you and these are the poets that i'm reading and the poets that inspire me this is all in one place It's an excellent teaching resource. I've had a few teachers reach out to me already to like put it inside their classrooms and give it to students there because a lot of these poems are ex- incredibly accessible for young people to read. It's a YA book. Um, you know, and it talks about some really current things which are happening to young people right now because we are living I I swear Gen Z and and younger are basically the most socially politically aware generation of generations and they have to be because we're living through interesting times as they say <laughs> no shit but yeah you you're going into detail about one of the poems earlier um so i was just, uh, there's so many great poems in here but the one of the poems i absolutely love is um sana asan's my dua is love and it's uh, in the section desire and it basically i think if you see her perform live she's performed this at a ted talk uh this year in which or no at the end of last year and she's absolutely amazing so the tedx london women talk um she was just amazing and so so remarkable and definitely one of the fiercest voices in performance um right now but also she's a psychologist so so she knows yeah. how to cut like cut deeply with her words It's it's amazing because if you look into the biographies of all of the poets in this book they are just such impressive people they've achieved so much and all of them are just so young like Sana for just, example like, as well like Sana is yeah. just fucking amazing she really really is like she's made a documentary on mental health with the BBC as well she's done so much um in the same way Sophia Tacker she has like collaborated with everyone from Nike to you know she went to ghana she's a real youth ambassador for black girls you know and how they're growing up and she you know she's done two ted talks there's like no number of things that i could say which would cover all of the amazing things all of the people in this book have already managed to do and most of them like are in their like early to mid 20s it makes me sick incredible. it makes me sick <laughs> and then just like fuck all of you because i'm an old bastard and have to sort of cling on to you through living vicariously through you bastards yes <laughs> but sorry yes you were, you you were going to read a, a passage from it or read a poem yes i was i was going to read sana's poem because i think that it's such a beautiful poem um and that i i love sharing it with like everyone although i would recommend hearing it from her herself because you know no one quite tells reads their poems like the poet themselves so i mean i've heard nikesh read his stuff and it's really boring Hey. Don't say that about the gay. I don't like. I say it to his face <laughs> and publicly. It's like it's not behind his back. No, but he's amazing and I don't like it whether it's publicly or behind his back. I love him also. <laughs> so, I get very protective about Nikesh. <laughs> I love him also. I love I him also. I love him. I love him also. Hey basket. <laughs> he put me in the book. Okay. I'll read it. Okay. I'm in the book. I read. Um I'm going to read it. So It's My Dua is Love. So this basically is a little bit of an introduction that Sana has given to her poem. My Dua is Love translates as My Prayer is Love. It explores my continually evolving and growing understanding of prayer. I'm learning that love in all its forms including sex and intimacy 
can be prayer in itself. This offering of my truth may give some insight into the journey I continue to travel in. Nikita, I think you glitched out with the word in, unless it's just my connection. Everyone in the comments, can you still hear her or is it just me? Oh. Hi, now you're back. <laughs> Sorry, like you, you said the word in and it froze for me and I'm not sure how it no, translates. I don't else. know what happened, my internet Okay, like... so in DJ terms, it's a rewind. We rewind the track, we reload it, start from the top. <laughs> Sorry. So um, basically, she said that this offering of my truth may give some insight into the journey. I continue to travel in seeking nearness to God. It has been a brave, liberating and tender mo movement away from externally imposed societal narratives of shame towards rewriting the inner script of my life with love and radical self-acceptance. This piece is both a celebration and, re and remembrance of God's unconditional love and presence interweaved with the love shared between two queer South Asian women. And this is the poem. I'm learning that the desire, <clears throat> I'm learning that the desire is not dirty, that I need not pray myself clean, that shame need not shove me to my knees, forehead to zameen, to bring me closer to my being. My dua is love. My dua is love. It pours pure like zamzam through my body, through her body, through my body, through her body. We are holy. We are holy in liquid size and sweat-soaked skin. I cannot tell where she ends and I begin, as love interweaves through estuaries of limb in this tapestry of brown. It is not a sin. It is not a sin. Instead, a gold prayer. It is a gold prayer. Whenever my name leaves her lips with devotion, I know that God is here. Whenever I am with her, I know that God is here. That is gangster. just so beautiful. That's so gangster. <laughs> just so beautiful. It's probably, there. It, you know, each and every one of the poems in this book made me so emotional, made me cry on public transport when I was reading the, the submissions as they came in. But yeah, I think like this poem, it, Every time I read it, it makes me cry. So, yeah, definitely hear the way that Sana gives it herself and tells it herself. It's beautiful. I mean, from a good <laughs> from a Guju standpoint, that's a fucking hell of an audio book plug right there. <laughs> so, when's when's your book out? Your actual like solo book? Um. So, the girl and the goddess is out on the first of October. And it is out on the 29th of September in the US. So, yeah. So um, there's someone in the comments, uh, Fav Stark, saying it's her birthday or their birthday. I don't know the gender, so I will change my um, approach. Uh, but can you read something for them? For their birthday? Perhaps, okay. from, the, from, uh, perhaps from the new book. From the new, from my book? Yeah. Oh, the, the, yeah, okay. All right. Um, because this is the book that I actually want, but you won't give me because you have a copy, you basket. And so I want to hear what I'm missing. <laughs> Not a basket. You basket, okay, total little, basket. Little, little bit of a basket. Um, okay, so I'm going to read out uh, the from the very, from Prasta prologue. And this is basically the second poem in the book. And oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Her name's Victoria. Is what Victoria. She's Victoria. Oh, yeah. lovely. Well, hello, Victoria. And um, this is a poem for when your birthday is going to be. Um, and it's a, it's a poem called A Secret From Me To You. There is a thing you should know before reading this tale. Despite my best efforts, I still do not know how to love myself. But here is the secret that no one told me. It's okay. It's okay to feel like you are drowning inside your own bones sometimes. It's okay to weep like a sky devoured by a storm. 
It's okay to be aware that there are wounds in you still that you aren't letting heal. Survival is ugly. Healing is messy. Self-love is complicated. It is your hardest days as much as your best days that help you grow. All of this is part of being human. You and I, we do not need to learn alone when we can learn together. How to be gentle with ourselves, how to be kinder to ourselves, especially when life feels like it is more endings than beginnings. Here is another secret no one will tell you. There aren't any masters of self-love, not even the gods and goddesses themselves. Fucking amazing. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> fuck off. That's awesome. That's so awesome. <laughs> I want to copy I that book, please. That yeah, absolutely. 100%. So it begins with that poem and then it just carries on all the way through. And I think what was really important to me is like dispelling this notion that self-love is just something you arrive into and then you live in because it changes every day. Like one day you could really be feeling yourself and like the next day it's just like, oh yeah, I'm not sure if I like myself today and that's okay. I just want to say the You're feeling yourself to... bit and all that is like a mom joke waiting to happen and I just wanted to get that away. <laughs> Seeing as seeing as Anushka's terrible. on this chat, I'm like, yeah, I'll get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, when's that book out? So it's on the first of first of October for everywhere else, and the 29th of September for the US. That's awesome. Right, yeah. anything else you want to plug? No, it's just these two book babies. I'm so excited. It's been a whole like quite a lot of hard work to make them happen and I'm so proud that these two very different but very powerful books and the world I'm really I'm really really proud <laughs> I tell you I, I'm like kind of like I said before I'm astounded that from the start of this lockdown you were kind of in a and I hope you forgive me for like saying this openly but you were kind of in a place of like despair and panic and now it's manifested with two fucking books which is <laughs> so gangster <laughs> I had to do something. Otherwise, I would just like fall into this like dark well and not know how to get out. Um, but yeah, there's other exciting things which I ended up doing as well, which I can't talk about yet. But yeah. Is there, is <laughs> there any elements it. of it you can talk about? Um, yeah, I think I can say, well, I can, I can actually talk about this. Um, I, I've been working on a script for TV. So yeah. Some exciting stuff happening. And you can't say what <laughs> TV or whatever. Like, it's just no, like, no, I've been correct. writing a script. I mean, for fuck's sake, we've all been writing scripts in our heads for years. Like, every motherfucker <laughs> on this whole thing has been writing a script in their head for years. Like, <laughs> tiny morsel, no? Little bit of info. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's an epic feminist, mythologically inspired... No um, shit. TV show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which I'm really, really excited about. <laughs> Have you heard, uh, did you hear the Audible um, version of The Sandman. Sandman? I started listening to it and then I had to stop because I had like 83 things happening at once. But the thing is that I'm going to reward myself with a proper sit down of sitting and listening to it for hours when I have the time, which is like end of this month. I, I don't know about you, but I can't deal with audio books at all. So I can't, I can't listen to um, works of fiction because I listen to things in a different way so I can't yeah. listen to audio books um, but reading Neil Gaiman's whole works I can I'm I'm down with um, yeah I don't know what I'm asking you I guess I'm asking like do you are you able to sort of transfer mediums and absorb works yes. in that way I think like it's been it's something that I, I would like to think that um I'm good at is that I'm able to easily try I'm easily I'm able to easily adapt between mediums. Um, I'm perfectly happy to do an audio book. I'm perfectly happy to do an audio drama. I'm perfectly happy to do like a script. That's because you're a malleable gangster. You can fucking do anything. I'm sorry. There's a great question here, by the way. There you go. Yeah. Uh, from Anushka saying, when can we howl at the moon together, Nikita? What does the moon give you? <laughs> 
I miss her so much. I miss you guys so much. I just want to like. I I really want. When do we do this? When do we like? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That was the best fucking response to a question ever. It was just like, when do we do it? Now. Bye, Niyati. See you later. Oh my god, but that was that was the best fucking response. I'm so I meant to say I can't wait, but like my phone fell over. When are we going to get to do this? It'll be amazing. <laughs> god, I am the most embarrassing. I can't take myself anywhere. I can't even take myself onto an Instagram live apparently. Okay, so has someone got a question for Nikita so I can go pee? Like a really good question that would have like a minute long answer so I can go read. <laughs> you should know that um Oh, Pavan's here. Pavan. Pavan. Look what we did. <laughs> we did good you things. We sold vinyl. <laughs> it's so majestic. Every it's time I so see it, majestic. it's so majestic. So much, and also yeah. Nikita's book. Wait, where, wait. So Anushka wants <laughs> to hear you talk about the moon. What about about? Do you want to like? I want to go and howl at the moon with her. Where do we get to do this? Where I don't like flip my screen over, like answering the question. <laughs> so right, Anushka, ask an actual question about the moon, and then Nikita will answer it. I love the moon. She's my girlfriend. That's the answer. She is. That's the. That's not enough time for me to go wee and come back. I love the moon. <laughs> she is my girlfriend. Hello. <laughs> she is. She. But I can't. You should know that I can't see anything. Like for some reason, my chat has frozen. So and the just last put, thing. Put, put your finger up. That's what she said. Um, that's what your mum said. Put your finger up. No, sorry. Um, but if you like tap on your face and then move it up, you see the comments. It's like frozen. On the last thing I can see is Shallow saying "internet baby." Okay, shit. Um, I've got Shallow saying I've got to work on my tantric bladder control. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So Anushka, she's saying, um, time, tell us about your lovership. The last time you about danced with the moon. The last time I danced with the moon. So that was the last full moon. I like to scare my neighbors. <laughs> I'm going to go wee on this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, it is a funny one because I do like to freak my neighbors out a little bit. So I, we live in like, in this little alcove with five different houses and I live on the top floor of the third house and whenever there's a full moon there are various things around me I like to bless with the with kind of like the glow of the full moon and the best way to do it is to go outside and do it because it's not really you can't really do it from the inside of the house so I take my my tarot so my druid set which I absolutely love and I take everywhere with me and I take that and I take my pendulum and I take a few other things and I take them outside to get blessed and I also make moon water which is just like water which is you know been blessed by the moon and after I blessed all of these things um, by the moon goddess I bring them in but what my neighbors probably see is this woman standing in like a long black or white gown depending and just like standing there with a candle with like these things in her hands so they probably think that they live next door to either a crazy lady or a witch. And um, it's it's fine because then I come in and I write and write and write because the moon's energy gives me like this, you know, this real energy to like write really beautiful things. And I do all of my most beautiful work on those nights. So I will risk my neighbors thinking that I'm bonkers because of this. Um, but yeah, full moon nights are great nights because I get to do this really fun kind of ritual which I've developed. Now, talking about a ritual that probably freaks my neighbors out because I take like a candle and I take all my tarot cards and everything and go and bless. <laughs> I can imagine bless that. <laughs> can, I, can I share what you described yourself as? What? What did I I'm describe myself? A uh, crazy lady and a witch. No, queer desi witch. Yeah, queer desi witch. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's basically. Um, so, I've come back and 
there's no more questions. Are there questions? It might have frozen for you as well, I'm telling you. Hmm. But I had a really good week. Um, so your rituals <laughs> and, and tarot is the one thing I can't get my head around. So there's, there's a whole thing about sort of different card spectrums and different sort of... Um, actually, this is a really male thing, so I'm going to stop. I was going to just—I okay. was just going to piss all over those chips. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I was going to show you one of the illustrations from the book. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the goddess Saraswati as the high priestess, and it's like it's part of the. <laughs> so what Paro is basically doing is that she's designing her own set of tarot cards in the book. Like that's part of the illustration project she's doing at the art university she's at, and she's designing her own. But like Saraswati project. famously plays the Veena, not a sitar, right? It's, it is the Veena, I could swear. It's a Veena, no. not a sitar. Yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I was looking at. And I was like, yeah, I did get that right, didn't I? The swans, the... yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Don't freak me out like that. Dude, I mean, you've got like, Anushka, is it a sitar or a Veena? Please answer. What did she say? Your mom's uh... a... <laughs> I mean, it's clearly a Vina. Yes, yes. But yeah, you were saying, so Saraswati, the illustration did a Saraswati. Yes. Well, yeah, it's just one of the tarot cards she designs. The funny thing is that she gets... Um... I'm not, no, because I'll give away the story then. But yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting story because the tarot does play a part in it. Mm. And it's funny because... Uh, Tarot is something which is full of a lot of feminine energy for me as well. And that's one of the beauty, beautiful things about the tarot and like, you know, all these spiritual things that we do. I think like a lot of my friends and I have little rituals we do together. Um, and they may not even be like obvious rituals, you know, like of the tarot or anything like that. But when you confess to a friend, you know, or you tell them all about what's happened to you, that in itself is a ritual, right? Yeah. Because you're trusting someone. And there's something really magical in being able to trust someone with your deepest, darkest secrets. So that in itself is a ritual. Um, it doesn't have to be something as like obvious as the tarot. Wait, one second. So. Someone's saying shut the question tab. So I'll, I'll, there you go. Is that working? No, it's still not working. I can't see. Can you see a question on your face? No. Okay, I can't either. But people are saying in the comments, shut the question tab. So I did um, again. Uh, let me know if it's working. But um, I forgot what I was going to ask you. I had a really pertinent question to ask you. Shit. Who's come to say hello? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, there was a question I had to ask you, which was about um, the idea of evolving culture is something that, mm -hmm. that is a common theme with me and all my friends, including you. Mm. Um, and the, the kind of resistance that you could potentially meet through evolving culture, is that something you've encountered or not? I mean, all the time, right? Like, I think one of the things about coming here so India does have its, its a lot of issues and I will never ever say that, you know, India is a country which is perfect and doesn't have any issues. We've got a lot of work to do. I think the world itself has a lot of work to do. But coming here, my experiences with race, racism were exponential compared to what, obviously, what I faced in India. And it made me really realize two things. One, I have light skin privilege. Mm -hmm. And as a light skin woman, I do not face the same level of racism that my dark skin brothers and sisters do. I just don't, right? But also in India, I have light skin privilege because colorism is a really big problem in India. And these kind of things just constantly help me evolve and change. I've always said that I'm a work in progress and I have a lot to learn. But being aware of my privilege of these certain things that I know that I have, you know, in regards to education, in regards to, you know, having a family that I was born in that said that I should be educated all the way to a master's degree, you know. Um, 
these are the privileges that I was born with. And to be able to evolve from that into the kind of culture that I've come here and evolved into, it's a constant learning process. Um, becoming educated about loads of things like, you know, um, issues about with what's going on with trans people in this country, you know, what Section 28 was in this country, the HIV epidemic, you know, so just LGBT history um, and the amount that I've even learned about LGBT history in India, just like being here and talking to people who are, you know, gay and lesbian and bisexual and trans, it is yeah, I don't think you can live this life without constantly changing and constantly evolving every day. There's a really great saying from Alice in Wonderland that I love, and that is basically, um, I think I knew who I was this morning, but I've changed a few times since then. And I, that's, yeah, that's kind of like, you are not the same person you were in the morning that yeah. you are at the end of the day. And that's a good way to be as a human being, I think, if you're constantly moving forward and for the better. Mm. Sorry, I think someone's saying the question tab is coming up again. Uh, so I have a question here. From uh, Praviz, is loving someone without trying to own them, can you please say something about it? Loving someone without? Trying to own them. Oh, wow. I have a lot to say about that. Um, so I believe very, very strongly that love is never, ever about ownership. You know, um, there are a lot of very toxic sayings about love, which kind of condone ownership between two people. And it's just like you're mine or like you, um, you know, you start talking about people like they're your other halves and that you were never whole without them. So, you know, this person is my other half. And a lot of the language around love revolves around this idea of finding your other half. Hmm. Whereas the truth is, what you're doing is you're finding a whole person who chooses you every single day. They don't need to choose you every single day, but they choose you every single day. And I think that is a lot more powerful than the idea of like super dependent love where you really, really, really need each other. And you're so dependent on each other that you choose them all the time. But yeah, I think also, it, it, like for me as a nerd, as a comic book collector, it becomes a, a completionist approach is that I will therefore own this to complete myself. Yeah, yeah. It becomes yeah, a collective, exactly. a, a collector kind of mentality. Yeah, yeah. You can't collect people. And also because people are so changeable every single day, you, they're not the same person that you first met. And, you know, the idea of ownership also revolves around possession, right? And possessions like inanimate objects don't really change. They get older and they wear and tear, but they don't really change in regards to their personality. People are not like that. People's personalities constantly change. Hmm. Um, you can't own someone like that. You know what? <laughs> There's a comment that I'd like to sort of uh, address. Uh, someone called Joel uh, is saying, these days girls are so wrong. I mean, what does that mean? Are you asking me or asking him? <laughs> I think kind I of both of you. I think I kind of read that and then wanted you to gun him. So um, I think one of the reasons why... Girls are wrong nowadays. Idea. In fact, let's yeah, discuss that. Why are girls wrong nowadays? <laughs> let's, let's discuss yeah, let's that. Into, let's just open it up. Let's go into this conversation. Why are to... girls wrong? Yeah. So I think people have just got used to women um, being quite like pliant and subservient and just putting up with a lot from the emotional labor to like, you know, in regards to sex, to all sorts of things. Like pe what people want is like a girl who would just quietly take it. And, and, and women these days are educated. They love themselves. They don't want to bloody take it anymore. So our standards have gone up higher. We expect more. And when I say we expect more, I mean, we expect to be respected, right? If we are going to bring love and, you know, immense amounts of care, emotional labor, all of these things at, to the table, we want our partners to match us because they're our partners. There are equals, right? And I think there are lots of men who can't handle that. I think there are lots of men who look at the idea of being equal to a woman as something that is not done for a man. 
And that's where all the problem is happening. That's where all the trouble is coming from, is that if you think that women these days are a huge problem, then maybe you never saw women as equals to start with. You never saw women as people. You saw them as objects or places to heal or something less than yourself. Mm. And that's where, that's where the conflict comes in. Mm. I'm not saying they're like... I think it's really important to acknowledge that there are good and bad people in both sexes. But I think it's really important to realize that patriarchally, women have been oppressed for centuries and centuries and centuries more than men could even imagine. I mean, you know? there's, there's a whole, there was a, a very, very, very good mutual friend of ours who's really well known, uh, whose partner at the time, like, gave me a whole lecture about how women were just genetically to be subservient what? and I was like bruv like you fucking kidding me it's a it's a yeah it was a thing yeah that makes me really angry that makes me really angry yeah. on a very yeah, yeah. level yeah. there's a question here um, from that's a great name not your Asima that's amazing but ass, <laughs> ass. Uh, your advice for authors just starting out um, one of my biggest pieces of advice, if you're an author just starting out, is that you need to be brave with it and you need to be ready to put in a lot of work. There is no shortcuts when it comes to this stuff. Like, I know there are people out there who seem to think that, hey, and this is in all forms of art. They're like, hey, that person was able to do it. I can easily do it, you know, and it doesn't look like that person's put in the work, but I know absolutely no overnight successes so none. Do, you, do you have any legs up so like for example i was uh, talking to shiloh earlier and her mom's an artist as well and um there's you know uh certain assumptions in fact with anushka as well like her dad's Ravi Shankar anushka like there's a whole thing and has there been any of that sort of nepotistic accusations to you too or has it all been from the get-go I, there's no one in my family who's a writer and mm. my parents didn't want me to be a writer. Mm. So they pretty much were like, not okay with and, the idea that I was going to do this. And I just want to clarify um, also with, with the two women I mentioned, they all did that shit on their own. I'm not, I'm not yeah, admiring yeah. them at all. I'm like a huge fucking yeah. fan of theirs. So I'm not no, saying I'm, anything negative like, I'm just, I mean, come on, like, honestly, like it's, it's a hard bloody world, you know? And like, I do wish I had someone in my in my life who basically said, hey, you know, I can help you um, because I think I would be a lot further along in what I want to do with my career instead of like just constantly restarting because that's what I had to do. Um, and I think there's a real benefit in that because if you're really, really talented, like both the women you just mentioned, like you should be nurtured. I think it's really important to have someone there who nurtures you mm. because otherwise like all artists, all creative people need nurturing. Right. And like, if you're really talented, the best way to bring out that talent and your gift is to be nurtured. And it's what I wish for all artists and poets across the world. I encourage all parents, like, please nurture. Mm. Like if you have any way of, of, or anyone in the family who is, a poet, a writer, an artist, a singer, whatever, and you, your child has taken an interest in that, please let them nurture that in them. Mm. Because you have no idea what a difference it makes to people's careers later on. Like, it really, really does, mm. you know? Okay. Um, and I wish, I wish I had that. I had, I, I did have to do it myself. And I do feel like, I felt, I feel resentful sometimes, I think, because, um, you know, it took what, I, I was in this country for about seven years uh, doing cleaning and like caring and those kind of jobs before something worked out. And it was very, very punishing. Mm. And I keep thinking about the amount of like work, which I could have done if I could have just focused on my art instead of trying to so survive. Like, it's like Tony know? Morrison talking about racism and how it's a fucking distraction designed to prevent you from doing your work. And sorry for interjecting, Nikita, but I want to say, Joel, um, there's a song by Prince called If I Was Your Girlfriend that I refer to like constantly about male ego and how to navigate um, a heartache from a woman to you and not be sexist. Just have a listen to it. It's awesome. 
Sorry, Nikki. I just have to sort of address that. No, it's fine. But, um, yeah. so, no, it's, Tony, it's, it's fine. Like Tony Morrison's approach to racism being a distraction from your work, I guess, uh, has to be a similar thing to sexism. And, and being what you poor. Do. Yeah. And being poor. Like, all of these things, um, they are huge. And it, it's because of the way that the world is built, right? Like, you can be Im immensely talented, but if you happen to be queer and brown and a woman, and, you know, circumstances have helped you back somehow, it takes you a lot longer to reach where you're supposed to reach. And unfortunately, we live in a culture of, like, ageism when it comes to art as well. And there's this idea that if you haven't made it by the time you're 30, you're over the hill. But Toni Morrison, who you were just mentioning, published her first book when she was 40, you know? And she wrote it, like, in the wee hours of the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning when, like, her she's a single mom. So just before her kids went to school, so she found a time to write. And people kind of mythologize that and go, oh, isn't that great? But it's like, I keep saying... I wish she didn't have to do that. I wish she had the ability to be able to only focus on her writing, you know, instead of having to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. So people kind of idolize that kind of culture of like, oh, this person stayed up all night for like years and then they got... It's just, it's 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 capitalist soup that your brain makes. Well, I think that... But here's the thing, you've stayed up all night and actually written books that have been like well-received. But you put the fucking work in. Like every yeah. word you can you can taste the blood that you put into those fucking words, right? And um and wait, someone just mentioned something about being in your forties. Uh yeah, I'm I'm in my forties too. Um and you know, I'm very privileged and very lucky. Um but that kind of giving of your soul makes the work more authentic, surely. Yeah, absolutely. No I'm Putting the work in is like, I mean, look at how hard Anushka works, you know? Um, look at how hard Nikesh works. Like, I think there is no such thing as, you know, a successful artist who hasn't worked hard. Mm -hmm. That's just not a thing. It, it's, you know, if you want to be successful at your work, you're constantly learning and you're constantly working and you're constantly, constantly trying to improve what you're doing. Um, so there is no such thing as like not working hard. I think there is like you, what we were talking about, distractions from the work. So, like, that's what I, what I was kind of talking and about. So, and so, bit. what if the distraction is your own family? What if the biggest fucking mountain you've got to climb is in your house? Like, that, that to me is, is what I've seen with a lot of talented friends of mine that's preventing them from achieving greatness, is this fucking insurmountable... Uh, bullshit from their own kith and kin i think yeah so it's you know because i don't have children like i can't speak for people's children but from my what i've seen and what i hear kids are a lot of work oh so i don't mean kids i don't mean kids at all i mean like uncles and parents and what's expected oh, wow. yeah so for years and years and years, I think like there were certain expectations on me to be a certain kind of person. Um, and that does, it distracts you. It does distract you. It gets in the way because especially there are still a lot of people um, in South Asian culture who believe that being an artist is like, it's not, it shouldn't be a thing, mm. you know? So you have a lot of adults in your life who are advising you against being an artist, right? And against doing this thing that you're very passionate about. And yeah, you know, that really does wear on you. I, I did, I think it, one of the stories I always go back to is, um, so a friend of mine who is, you know, um, English and white um, and they're poet as well. So uh, he took me, I met his family basically at like one of these events that we were doing. And, you know, this this guy's like a poet and everything. And it, his parents were just so hugely supportive. They were so supportive. They were just like, yeah, you know, like he had to like do this. So we like, you know, we mortgaged our house to make sure he went to art school and this, that and the other. And I was just looking at all of that. And I was like, what you the mortgaged fuck? your house to send your child to art school? Like that happens there are parents like are you are you unicorns you sound like unicorns like 
What the fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so why. That, that, but that's why I asked about nepotism because in India, in particular, it's a middle class kind of privilege in terms of being an artist or a writer, uh, which mm. in the West is very working class. So there's a, there's a discrepancy there, which is why I asked that question. Yeah, yeah. I think like um, I was always really creative, and I don't think there was anyone who's ever going to stop me from being able to be that way. And there are lots of people who did like kind of go. Mm, is are you sure this is what you want to do with your life? And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be like a, a gay Desi witch. Yeah, that's it. Like, <laughs> are you going to stop me? I feel sorry for you for trying. It's a waste of your time. But that, but that that's entirely my point. Is that 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 kind of drive I think comes from oppression, no? Or it comes from like a, a, a it comes from a a point of saying. Well, it, it comes from, sorry, a rebellion about saying you shouldn't be this, and therefore I would be this even harder. So fuck you. Absolutely. Like I think if someone ever said to me I couldn't do this, they did me the biggest favor ever, because the more people told me I couldn't do something, the more I wanted to do it. And how how um, do people take you now? Do you know? I think one of the most satisfying things in the world is like when people who had rejected me or told me I couldn't do something. Kind of message me to tell me, oh, I'm so proud of you. You've done so well for yourself and everything. And yeah, it gives you that little bit of like quite petty satisfaction. But it's temporary, going, yeah. right? That's the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think it's important not to get distracted by the by the praise. Um, if if you ever get praise as an artist, it's very easy to be distracted by. It. The same way, it's very easy to be distracted by a negative review and just think that you're shit. Yeah, you know. Um, so it's really important to block all of that out and just create the things that you want to create. Read the books that you want, like write the books that you want to read, you know, um, be true to who you are, be true to who you are as an artist. And just remember that great, great amount of praise or great amount of negative feedback both have the exact same um, reaction in your brain. Yeah, you either think you're really shit and you can't do it, or you think you're so good you don't have to try anymore. And it's equally negative. So how do you stop yourself becoming a dickhead? Uh, By well, the positive, okay, because <laughs> yeah, because like honestly, you're so like you've you've been like so. Aside from the negative bits, you get a lot of praise. How do you temper yourself from not being that dickhead? I think I always look back at my work and think that I could do better. Mm. That's I am my own worst critic in a lot of ways. And the good way I feel is that I always look back at my old work and think, you know what? I could have really done better. Mm. And the next book will be better because of that. Um, it is important to look back at your old work and understand that that work serves a purpose and it serves the people that it serves, but it's also important to look back at your old work and go, do you know what? I could definitely do better than that. I could do something more different than that. I could do something bigger than that, you know? And when you're like that, you're constantly humbling yourself as well, because you're constantly looking at your, you know, either your peers or the people who are doing this so much better than you. And you're constantly going, wow, they're so amazing. And I hope one day I get there, mm. you know? So to be an artist is to be constantly humbled. By I think you're already around. there, quite frankly. <laughs> I think you're already there. You just do lovely. I'm like, come on, develop more dickheadishness, please. Like, please be more of a dickhead, please. Like, you need to be more of a dickhead. Like, get spiky in Gujarati. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> spiky in Gujarati, I love that. I'm like a Gujarati puffer fish. I love it. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. But yeah, so I'm going to go now because I need to wee really yes. badly. Thank you so Again. much for doing this for like two hours. Thank you. I had such a lovely time. Two hours chat. So oh, we have to meet. Yes, we shall. But there's one question here. Wait here. Oh, wow. Okay. This is quite an existential question, so I'll ignore that. Okay. But, um, no. oh. oh yeah, the whole reason why I do this, you have a book out. Yes, <laughs> two books. So I have one book out called Slam. It is all the amazing, lovely poets who I really admire are in this book. And I've read out one of the poems from here by Sana Khan, who's amazing. Um, 
And then the other book which is coming out on the 1st of October is The Girl and the Goddess. And this has got Hindu deities and storytelling and grandmother motherly wisdom and tarot and partition and like living in a war zone. And it's, it's badass. So you follow this young girl through all of those things and you follow her through like sexual assault and misogyny and all sorts. And she breaks through the board and she, yeah. I won't tell you what happens at the end, but yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. Um, so one last question. Joel says, uh, happiness or satisfaction? Happiness or satisfaction? One word answer. I think satisfaction. Obviously, I right? Think satisfaction. Yeah, I think satisfaction. Obviously. I think satisfaction is more important. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, look, lovely. Thank you. We will meet offline and drink in person. And thank you yes. everyone for joining us. Um, thank for, you, like, guys. These last two hours of nonsense. <laughs> Big hugs. Mwah. Okay. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.